gentlemen, uh, for today's webinar, which is being organized uh, on behalf of IPK veterans by Stripe in collaboration with Surya Veteran Intellectual Forum. IPKF operations is a part of Indian military history which appears to have been forgotten to be. There had been many questions. People questioned the sending of IPK, conduct of IPK operations and the timing of its return. So we thought that it would be in the fitness of things that we take it upon ourselves and try to bring it to the knowledge of everyone who is interested in the history and know that IPKF is a very, very important part of our kingdom. We are indeed honored to have three erudite scholars amongst us, soldier scholars, part of this great operations. N.K. Kapoor, who was at that point in time was part of the IPKF at Podo, saw it at a ringside view. And later, he kept going in the Indian Army and retired as a Lieutenant General. We also have General Joseph Manavalan, who was part of Four engineer regiment, which was in the thick of the operations in the IPKF. We have Colonel Sidhu from 50, also part of the operations. And finally, Colonel Manoj Chanan from Ahmad Corps. They all saw it themselves. <clears throat> On behalf of Strive, I welcome all the veterans of IPKF and let me assure you that you feel indeed honored by your presence. Now, without taking much of time, now I request General Kapoor to deliver his keynote address. Before that, a small announcement. You all are requested to put your questions in the chat box, which will be taken up during the question answer session by the anchor. And also, before I start, one more small disclaimer that these are our individual views and strike takes no responsibility for the statements made during this webinar. Now I invite Lieutenant General Kapoor, PBSM, ADSM, oh, yeah. to commences keynote address to today's webinar. Over to you, sir. Mm -hmm. right, okay. and Kaputo, please unmute yourself, sir. The request sent already. Sir, Jana Kapoor, sir, unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you, friends. Good evening to you. Thank you, Strife and SBIF, for this invite. This webinar is our tribute to all our comrades who made this ultimate sacrifice in our common. Needless to say that the experience gained and the lessons learned by us will greatly help in planning any out-of-area operation in the future. indo sri Lankan relations were more or less on an even keel till the end of late 60s, when a prominent group started propagating that a weak and poor Sri Lanka needed support to strong and rich power rather than India which was weak and poor itself. This idea 
to gain white currency. A belligerent assisted Pakistan during the 71 operations. It also invited Israeli and Pakistani forces to suppress the insurgency. It provided broadcasting facilities to the Voice of America at the law. And it also signed some contracts with U.S. firms for maintenance of oil farms at Trinco. These events called, caused a flutter in India, as we saw it as the U.S. trying to gain a toehold in Sri Lanka, which could snowball into a U.S. base. With this in mind, and keeping an eye on the Tamil Nadu politics, Mrs. Gandhi decided to weaken Sri Lanka by assisting Tamil militancy. On becoming Prime Minister, Rajiv wanted to reset this relationship. And he told Jayavardhane that India would be willing to commit to the unity and territorial integrity of Sri Lanka. But because of the affinity with Sri Lankan Tamils and Indian Tamils, India will continue to provide support to the just and legitimate aspirations of the Tamil community. Please note the words, just and legitimate. These words were music to Jayavardhana's ears, and he decided that he could do business with India. However, the Sri Lankan parliament had a number of die-hard anti-India parliamentarians. They, they, wanted, uh, they wanted to pursue a military course rather than negotiations. So Sri Lanka proceeded on two parallel lines. One, to negotiate with India, and two, to raise a force on force to meet the challenges. This force would be supported by USA, UK, Israel, South Africa, Pakistan, and China, and some others. While this work was in progress in May 1985, in May 1985, Sri Lanka was rocked by a violence of high order. This was perpetuated by the Tamil, Tamils as well as JVP uh, party, which wanted leftist party, which wanted to gain power in Sri Lanka. The government was not able to control this and therefore decided to fall back on India. India's, India facilitated talks between Tamil parties and the government of Sri Lanka, and they agreed to talk at Thimpu in Bhutan. And some very positive proposals were decided upon. It is at this point that Prabhakaran in Thimpu found that the various Tamil parties were all pulling in different directions. And therefore, he decided to eliminate their leadership and become the sole arbiter of Tamil interests. LTT wanted the Ilum to be fought for militarily. At this point of time, unfortunately, India lost focus on Sri Lanka for some time. That was because it was involved with China in the post-Wangung 
settings and also with Pakistan after the exercise brass tax. Unfortunately, at this time, the Bofors scandal also exploded. Sri Lanka found this window of opportunity to launch offensive operations in Jaffna and Bavonia. They carried out a blockade, economic blockade of uh, Jaffna and they bombarded the civil population. Alarmed by the events, Rajiv Gandhi's messages to Devardhane to stop Tamil genocide fell on deaf ears. Instead, Devardhane ordered his forces to raise Jaffna to ground. That is when India wanted or wanted and decided to intervene. After an abortive attempt to send support by sea, India sent five AN-32 aircraft with supplies and medicines. These aircrafts were escorted by four Mirage 2000 air fighters. And Sri Lanka was uh, uh, Sri Lanka was told 24 hours in advance that there will be an air drop at Umalai. They were also requested not to obstruct because the fighters had orders to retaliate. In the, in the, the dropping, famously called the bomb, bomb, Jaffna bombing of uh, bread, bombing, bread bombing of Jaffna was very successful. Fearing an armed intervention by India, Sri Lanka called off their operation. Javardhane had realized that SLF was not up to the mark to meet the militancy. He therefore decided to talk to India. <clears throat> A draft record was prepared by India and it was circulated amongst all the stakeholders. Everyone agreed except Prabhakran, who thought the accord should have been signed between NTT and Sri Lanka and not between India and Sri Lanka. These reservations were set swept aside as the RAW and IB who exercised great power on him, said that they will bring him around and there will be no problem. So, the accord was signed on 29th July at Colombo in a very hostile atmosphere because the JVP, the LTT, the Sri Lankan Freedom Party and the, Tam and the Buddhist clergy were all against it. There were three main clauses which will concern us in this accord. One, cessation of hostilities within 48 hours and surrender of weapons by militants in 72 hours. Two, merger of northern and eastern provinces into a single administrative unit to be governed by a council which will be elected in three months. And three, Indian military will pro provide assistance to Sri Lanka for implementing their court. There were a couple of other points like Tamil language and the, uh, uh, going back of refugees from Mandapam and so on. As this accord was signed, Javardhane requested Rajiv to send a force to Jaffna and Trincomalee to oversee the accord. Rajiv 
accepted it called uh, immediately and 54 days for leading elements started landing in Jaffna within 24 hours. Now gentlemen, this was the pain of all the problems. We had no warning, we had no mobilization, there was no planning or preparation. And the force was inducted across the seas into a foreign land with uh, an ad hoc command and control setup and a rudimentary logistic system. Jaff Knights welcomed by PKF. Prabhakaran met OFC at uh, Madras on 1st August 87. He agreed that the Tamils were greatly eased because of this accord. But however, he was still against the accord and he used very strong words. He said he would never again trust the MEA or the RAW and that he would teach Rajiv Gandhi a lesson. Jafina was limping back to normal. There was peace. Weapons were surrendered, but these were the weapons which India had given to the LTT and not the weapons they have acquired from other forces. We had no knowledge how much they had acquired, they had acquired from others. Everything seemed to all right till suddenly lightning struck and it struck on 3rd of October when a boat carrying 17 armed LTT cartridges were intercepted by the Sri Lankan Navy. They were brought to the air base at Palali for onward rush when to Colombo. There was quite a confusion here. It will take quite a long time to explain everything. But suffice it to say that before these people could be airlifted, they took cyanide and 12 of them, including important LTT leaders like, like Marappan and Pulindran, died. Prabhakaran immediately released their cord and the LTT launched wide, large scale massacre around. On, on 7th of October, IPKF was ordered to use force. Now, this contingency, where a peace saving force was to turn into a peace enforcement force, had not been planned. The trip had not been thought of either by the government of India or by army headquarters. And therefore, there was no planning and preparation. It was a bolt from the blue. General Dikinder, though I've seen, appreciated the requirement of six to seven infantry gates, a commando battalion, an armored regiment, a mechanized infantry battalion, and a, a field regiment for capturing Jaffna in four days. He had a meager force of two infantry brigades, a commander battalion, a squadron of armor, and a battery of artillery when he commenced the operation on 10th October. The 3rd Brigade landed on 12th October, 4th Brigade landed on 15th October, and the 5th Brigade landed on 18th October. And all these forces were pushed into action without orientation as they landed from the Jaffna was captured in 17 days. On 26th October, it was a very costly victory. LTT moved south and withdrew into the Wani jungles. IPKF set about resuscitating Jaffna 
with a massive civic action. Jaffna was peaceful, but one in jungles skirmishes continued. At this point, two more divisions were inducted to suppress the LTT and in order to carry out the elections later on. Four Dev and 57 Dev were brought in. Now, IPKF had enough force and it launched Operation Checkmate in one in jungles in August 88, in which a large number of infantry battalions carried out massive coordinate search operation and found that the LTT leadership was within the moves and would have been eliminated given some more time. Probably an SOS was sent by LTT because we suddenly had a whole Tamil community in all over the world, including some organizations like Amnesty International and all saying that if they wanted a peace, like if they wanted a ceasefire so that Prabhakar could be brought out for negotiations. General Carter was dead against it. There was no way he would agree. But then there was a brigade called the Peace Brigade, which wanted peace given a chance, led by Raw, I.D. General Sardesh Pandey, GOC 54 Division, and Brigadier Kalu, Town Commandant Jaffna, and they prevailed. The government of India decided to give a ceasefire, and culprit was made to announce a four day ceasefire which extended to the 80s. LTT got on the hook, and there was no talk of negotiations thereafter. Sri Lankan government rightly thought that IPKF had deliberately reached out Bakran and secured his movement outside the border. Now, the time was to select the, go elect the government and preparations started in good force. Although the LTT was opposed to it and Sri Lanka was also opposed to it, the elections were elections were carried out peacefully and, and Fred Rajan Pirumal became the chief minister. However, the government of Sri Lanka now made an about turn and refused to dwell powers onto him and they became defunct. Uh, became the president in January 89. He immediately negated the accord, lifted the ban on LTT, and also scrapped the merger of North and Eastern provinces. Sri Lanka was back to where it was in the 83-87 period. Then that also gave a warning to the IP to withdraw by July, failing which force was being used. Visualizing, of, uh, visualizing an armed encounter of Rubicon was planned. However, General Patwart was able to pacify at Rindasa and say that we will withdraw within five, six months, but withdrawal will continue immediately. Next day, a ship carrying leave parties sailed off from Colombo and, and uh, announcement was made that IPKF has started withdrawing. And we lost the elections in December 89. The new government under VPC immediately asked IPKF to withdraw by March 90. IPKF withdrew unsound after performing a task 
which was thankless, but was performed brilliantly. Was I gave ready? This question, the answer to this question, begs answer to another question. What was expected out of it? Nobody has answered that. Question. When the time came to eliminate IPKF, time came to eliminate it, the government of India had flat feet, it developed cold feet, and the government to which we had gone to assist, they decided to receive to negate the court themselves. The central government. Tamil Nadu government, the government and the opposition and the opposition and and the and 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 the LTT continued by explosives from Sivakashi and LTT casualties came back to India in hospitals in Tamil Nadu for treatment while the battle was on. This was the state. The entire episode can be summed up as a blind man's bluff. Thank you.